This video is 9.1 sequences. So a sequence is defined as a function whose domain is the set of positive integers 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, etc, etc. Um, a1, a2, a3, an, and all the way up as high as your domain goes, um, are the terms of the sequence. An denotes the nth term. So a1 is the first term, a2 is the second term, a3 is the third term, so on and so forth, till you get to the nth term. And then there are some still after the nth term, depending on your domain. Um, the entire sequence is denoted by this. So the nth term kind of give you, gives you the formula to find each individual term. So for example one, it says find the first five terms of the sequence where a n equals this. So if I wanna find the first term, that means that my n is one. So I'm gonna plug in one for n. So we get one as the first term of the sequence. Then for a two, we're gonna plug in two for n. So we get four over four minus one, which is four thirds. For the third term, we get nine over eight minus one, which is nine sevenths. Here we're gonna plug in four for n and we're going to get 16 over 16 minus one. And then finally, five for n. So we're gonna get 25 over 32 which is 25 over 31. And so the first five, five terms of the sequence would be one, four thirds, nine sevenths, 16 over 16 fifteenths, and then 25 31. Okay, so notice here it says, let n be a positive integer then n factorial is defined as n with an exclamation point. That's how you denote n factorial. And that's equal to one times two times three all the way up until you get to n. So multiply all the integers until you get to n. As a special case though, zero factorial is defined as one. So if you see zero factorial, it's just one. Um, this is an example for like three factorial means three times two times one, or the reverse, like in the definition, one times two times three, and you stop at the end, the value you were given in the factorial. Now here's an example of something a little bit different, and it's an expression factorial. This is n plus one, and notice how I did with three. I wrote the n first, and then started decreasing to get to one. So it's the same thing here. If I decrease this number by one, I have just n. If I decrease this number by one, I get n minus one. And if I keep going, eventually I'm gonna get down to three, two, one, depending on what n is, of course, right? Assuming that n is greater than three, then this is true. Now, um, but you'll notice that this right here itself is n factorial. So n plus one factorial can actually be written as n factorial times n plus one factorial. The same can be said for something kind of like five factorial. Five factorial can be written as five times four times three factorial. Instead of writing three, two, one, you can just write three factorial. So you can take out however many um, you need to according to whatever it is that you're trying to manipulate, okay? so. In example two, it says simplify the ratio of factorials. So notice that the bottom's um, value that's being factorialed, fact, I don't know how to say that word, <laughs> factorialed, I don't know any if that's even a word, but this expression is bigger than this expression before the factorial, which means this one's probably one that needs to get um, 
broken apart cleverly, okay? So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna first write out this expression and then I'm gonna decrease it by one. But we can't stop here and put the factorial there because we want to cancel out this one. So if I keep going and I decrease this by one again, I get two n. And instead of continuing all the way down to one, I can just put the factorial here. And then at the top, I have two n factorial. So all of these factors will reduce with all of these factors, leaving me with just one over 2n plus 2 times 2n plus 1. So that is how you reduce something with factorials. It's better to break up the, the factorial that has um, a bigger expression to begin with and keep breaking it down until you get to the smaller one and therefore they'll reduce. Now, um, I do want to go over some definitions and properties on the next page and then we'll hit the examples probably in another video. So here, this says the definition of the limit of a sequence. Let f be any real number. The limit of a sequence, a n, is l, and it's written as the limit of the nth term equal to l. If for each epsilon greater than zero, there exists an m instead of a delta, such that a n minus l is less than delta whenever n is greater than m. If the limit exists, then the sequence converges to l. If the limit does not exist, then the sequence diverges, okay? So we're not gonna have to do any epsilon m um, proofs or anything like that in this section. This is just the formal definition of a limit. But what we need to pay special attention to is that if you take the limit of the nth term and you get a real number l, then the limit exists and the, sequ the sequence converges to that number. If the limit does not exist, the sequence diverges, okay? That's what we need to pick from that definition. Um, the limit of the squeeze of a sequence theorem. Let L be a real number. Let F be a function of a real variable such that the limit of F of X equals L. And if A N is a sequence such that F of N equals A N for every positive integer N, then the limit of a n equals l as well, okay? Now, we don't typically use this a whole lot, um, but it is there just in case you need to use it. Um, I don't think that any of the problems that we have in WebAssign require us to do that because we automatically get the limit just by looking at um, the limit of the nth. Now the properties of limits of sequences are if you have two different sequences and one limit is L and the other's limit is a real number K, then you have the scalar multiple. If you have a multiple times that sequence, then you'll end up with that multiple times its limit. Okay, of course where C is a real number. The sum or difference. So if I add or subtract these two sequences from each other and I take the limits, I'm going to get their limit values added or subtracted together as well, respectively of course. So if there's a plus here, there's a plus here. If there's a minus here, there's a minus there. Now the product as well, if I take the product of the two sequences nth terms, then I will get the product of their limits. And the quotient as well, if I take the quotient of the two nth terms of the individual sequences, I'll end up with the quotient of the um, limits. Now, be careful. This is only true if this denominator is never zero for any n. So as long as the nth term is not going to be zero for any n value, then you can use this quotient rule. Also, the limit itself cannot be zero as well. And then this rule will apply.